Yo, 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 Thought Warriors. What is up? It is I, Van Lathan. It's me, Rachel Lindsay. Yes, we are here. Higher Learning is on. Uh, Rachel. Van. How was your weekend? My weekend was good. I can't even tell you the last time I took days off. So it was Thanksgiving, which was small, chill, obviously mm-hmm. couldn't travel. My sister's still here. So I was able to do it with her and one other friend. And um, it was good. We had a good time. And I just, I really enjoyed getting things together, like finding my peace of mind, having Mm -hmm. days off, doing nothing. I mean, I almost forgot to wake up this morning and go to work because I've been off for like five days. It's a beautiful thing. thing. Yeah. What about you? Uh, Cool and chilling, chilling. Dealing, coping, watching. Uh, I went, shout out to Sterling. Shout out to my man, Sterling. Stilo Brim. I went to his house on Saturday night and watched the uh, the fight. <gasps> Man, he had yeah. a um, he had a little thing. Not not too many people. Okay, you know, nice you know how distance. hey, nice and distanced. You, you want to clarify on this not, podcast? Not, not too many people. Okay. Nice and distanced. Okay, he's very he's very prosperous. He's got a nice crib. We went out there, uh, played a little pool, um, and watched the fight. And yeah, listen. <laughs> it, it was. It, 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 look, look. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Okay. What's the thing? Now, there's been a lot of discussion about whether or not we're being too hard on Nate Robertson. Yes. Now, if you guys didn't know what happened this past Saturday, there was a, a Triller boxing event. Triller carried it. And there were several fights. Some of them, you know, real professional boxing fights. A couple of real professional <laughs> boxing fights. It was. Badu Jack fought. Badu Jack is a former, he- uh, not, not heavyweight, a former, I think, 168 champ. Or one six seventy five champ. I don't know. Badu keep getting. But didn't robbed. he fight a school teacher? He fought a dude that. Yeah, he fought a guy. Look, he you gotta take fights like that sometimes when you when you kind of get back into it. Now he gets busy. If you know him, the, the history on that fighter, he gets busy. But he's been robbed a couple of times, man. Mm-hmm. A couple of times. Um, I'm pretty sure it's one sixty eight. It might be. It might be one seventy five that he fights at though. Uh, anyway, um. Oh, he fights at both 175 uh, and 168. Which weight okay. class is 168? Do you know? For 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 ten thousand dollars, what's okay. the name of the weight class for 168 pounds? All right, um, it's above welterweight. It's above welter. You on the way? It's like literally, it's it's above welterweight. So 168 okay. middleweight. What's, you so close. Mid midweight. Midiweight. 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 No, you're so. It's super middleweight. Oh, come on. It's true. 140 is light middleweight. 147 is uh well to uh, excuse me. 140 is light welterweight. 147 is uh is welterweight. 154 is light middleweight. Then there's middleweight, 160, then 168. I was so super close. middleweight. So close. And then 175 is light heavyweight, and then we go on up. Uh anyway, so he fought a real guy. Um uh now, of course, the main two fights that everybody wanted to see. It's Nate Robinson versus Jake Paul. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, the main event, real main event, the big main event, Mike Tyson versus Roy Jones Jr. You were looking forward to Jake Paul versus Absolutely. Nate Robinson? Okay, Absolutely. I wasn't. I wasn't. Why? I just, I was like, really? It's the much I, more interesting fight. Well, it is now. No. But coming in, I thought, what am I about to watch? Like, it didn't, it, it didn't feel like boxing. It Why felt like. Why do you like, feel that way? Because one was fighting for the very first time, who's come from a double-digit NBA career, is known in other circles and has nothing to do with boxing. Mm -hmm. The other one is a big mouth, loud mouth YouTuber who, Mm -hmm. as you saw at his with his interview with Jim Gray, was promoting his 17 other projects. And Jim Gray had to reel it back and say, but are you going to take this thing seriously? Mm -hmm. So to me, it was more of entertainment than it was to actual actually watch the sport of boxing. I mean, even mm-hmm. Jim Gray looked like, I can't believe my career has come to this that I'm sitting here. That's, that was a look on his face the entire mm-hmm. time he was interviewing mm-hmm. Jake Paul. So right. for me, I was like, this isn't really the sport of boxing. I'm ready for the main event. That's how I felt. I'm glad you I, said I was that. wrong. I was wrong. No, I'm glad, you, I'm glad you said that. And I'll tell you why I'm glad. Okay. Because I want people to know something. Okay. Jake Paul is a real boxer. Okay. Okay. Okay, why? Okay. I train in the valley. With Phil uh, Pol- you've with, already with, lost with, me. With that Phil you Polina. lost me with I train. Okay. <laughs> because, what are you going to say? 
I, You've no, seen I, him? He, he spars in there all the time. And by the way, when Jake Paul spars in there, he doesn't spar guys in the gym. They bring in pros for Jake to fight. Like, Jake okay. Paul boxes six times a week. He's being trained by BJ Flores, uh-huh. who is an ex-UFC uh, guy. Mm-hmm. They are taking boxing seriously. Jake Paul is in there working. I go in there. By the way, we all spar. We all get in the ring when we when we when we in oh, the so gym. Oh, so you've seen Jake Paul's hands? Yeah, you sparred with him. No, and I've he's never good? sparred with him. Okay, I've never sparred with him. But I've I've watched him spar a bunch of times. And by the way, I've never seen him take an L in there. As a matter of fact, just before this, mm-hmm. they put a guy in with Jake that was a heavyweight, that was a heavyweight that had that had come down to one seventy five, and Jake worked him. Now, I'm not saying he's the best, but I'm saying he's been boxing for three years in a very serious manner. This uh, isn't, this is, I'm not saying that he hasn't trained, right? Because Nate Robinson was training six days a week, two times a day. That's what it came out. But only for like it, six weeks. It takes you four was, months to learn how was to stand. He, was it really only six weeks? Yeah, okay, Jay, but see, this, is, this is going, but that's going to my point. It's not necessarily a knock against Jake, even though I'm clearly not a fan. It's more of, I know he's only done two fights. It's more of, the fact that they matched him up with Nate Robinson. So how am I supposed to take a Jake Paul seriously? If I'm coming into this sport watching this, how am I supposed to take Jake Paul seriously when you put him up against somebody who's been there, who's been training for six weeks? To me, it's just a form of entertainment mm-hmm. more than I am about focusing on the sport. Do you see what I'm saying? That's you're where right. I guess I'm coming in. You're right. I, but, I, but, I, but I tell people, I tell people even then, I'm like, this is, first of all, it's not a mistake. Nate Robinson is going to make like a million dollars. So it's not a mistake. He he did, the, he, he did, he took the fight for the reason he wanted to take the fight. He's going to make a bag. Good on Nate. That's the way that it goes. Okay. What I was saying was that, and I've been saying this for months, and I said it like under Nate's thing, un, in, un, in Nate's comments. I'm like, Nate is in some trouble. Because listen, people don't get it about boxing. And I didn't get it when I first started doing it. I thought, hey, big, strong guy, I'm going to be able to go in there and do that. No way. Like, you you get inside of that ring, and if you don't know how to breathe, and you're not composed, and, and you don't know how to stand, and you mm-hmm. don't have the balance, anybody will get picked apart. And so when they put him in there, with this, I was like, yo, that's going to be wild. I was telling people that night, I'm like, Nate is going to get, and Nate is a fantastic athlete. If Nate had been boxing all of his life, and they will probably be the, the, the fucking maybe, welterweight champion of the not. world. But no, he's a, he's a fantastic athlete, but he hasn't. And you, it's just not a sport. Like his athleticism in boxing just doesn't have, his athleticism in the NBA just doesn't have anything to do with boxing. Absolutely. Right. I think that that's clear as day. One plus one does not equal two here. Right. I think that's the way to see it. Just because, and I guess, and the reason I guess I'm shocked that it was six weeks is because if, you, you saw six weeks, eight weeks, whatever it was, it, whenever to, he decided to take the I fight. I thought it yeah. was at least a year. That's why I'm shocked. No. Because he's been talking, saying, oh, you know, they found old tweets of him saying, you know, just give me a couple of years in the ring and basically I can see anybody. So I thought that might not be been, true. I mean, I that, thought yeah. he'd been training for this or just, just to transition at least into boxing. Maybe not this match, but mm-hmm. to transition into being a boxer. So I was floored when I found otherwise. And now it all makes sense. From the moment the bell rang to the first move that he had in the ring, it all makes sense now. Right. He Look, it, what he was saying about if you give me a couple of years to train, I, I might be able to do something. He's, he might be right. I got in there and at first it was... I thought lit- that's what we were getting. I, I got in there, and at first, it was just about stamina, trying to lose weight, and all of that stuff like that. But then when you even, when you start hitting the speed bag, you start working the heavy bag, you start learning how to put punches together, and when you start sparring, you're in a situation to where if you make a mistake, you feel pain. And yeah. so, it like in, in something like that, you got to be, you got to have ring time. So... The fact that he got slipped, and by the way, I don't know if you guys, if you had been hiding under a rock, but Jake sent Nate Paul night night, and and he sent him night night off an adjustment because when the fight when the fight started, if you go back and watch the fight, Jake thought that he was going to fight a traditional boxing fight because that's right. what he's been doing. Nah, he couldn't get his jab going because Nate would just rush him, and so what he ends up starting to do is forget about the jab. When he rushes in, I'm a timer. Mm-hmm. And get him with the right, he, and he cracks with the right hand. He took him out. 
Did you think, remember the first hit that knocked Nate down? He uh-huh. was saying he hit him in the back of his head. Mm-hmm. Did you think, and when they replayed it, he really did hit him in the back of his head. Right. That is that, that's an illegal hit? Yes or no? I'm not, I don't quite understand it, it, it's the illegal, rules. What should have happened? To, it's illegal to hit somebody in the back of the head, but also though, the way that that, that happened is he kept running in and with, with like with his head first. Yeah. And a right hook came out. Yeah. And so the, the shot got him behind the ear, which is one of the best, one of the worst places or best or worst, depending on who you are, to get hit. Uh, question. Do you think that the, the uh, attention and criticism that Nate Robinson is getting on social media uh, is warranted? Or do you agree with people like Glenn Big Baby Davis, who is like, I better not see any of y'all in these streets if y'all don't stop making fun of Nate? Okay, so that's and Floyd Glenn. and Floyd who took up for him too, who had a right. very nice message. So I look at it both ways. Okay. Okay. First of all, did you know that Glenn Davis is my cousin? I can see it. Yeah, he's my cousin. I can see he's it. My first cousin. He's, he's from Baton Rouge. Yeah. On yeah. on your mama's side or your daddy's side? My dad's side. Because that's how you say it. He's my first cousin on my daddy's side. Your first cousin on my dad's okay. side. Okay. Yeah. Glenn right. Davis from um. From U High, then went to LSU, Baton Rouge through and through. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Baton Rouge through and through. Okay, so I see it both ways. Okay. Two ways. Because I've been in the ring, Mm -hmm. if you got in the ring, if you get inside the ring and you actually fight, it just takes so much nuts. It just, you know, or it just, it just takes so much to actually go in there and do it. You see guys that come around and they mess around in the gym and, Mm -hmm. and they, they bang around, they hit the heavy bag, they jump rope. But then when it comes time to put some gear on and actually get in there and do it, they don't want to do it, okay? So I've been Nate Robinson before. Yeah. When Phil first put, put me in against Carlos and we were actually sparring, Carlos did not take it easy on me. And he was just, and he was he was whooping my ass and I was trying to survive. I, I sparred a guy who fought Luis Ortiz. Mm. Like I, I, I sparred a six foot eight, 275 pound Romanian guy, right? So if you get, if you're willing to get in there, you got all the love and respect for me, and I gotta say that about Nate Robinson, right? Okay. At the same time, you're gonna get these jokes, right? As okay? soon as we knew he was okay. Yeah. Right? As soon as we knew, I mean, before we knew he was okay. No, I need like, to see like him me, get like, up. I need like him we, to get off the. Off I mean, the mat. obviously, but obviously, if we found out he wasn't okay, then the jokes would stop. But in the in the the immediate aftermath. You think that people waited to no, see him up didn't. on the street? No, they didn't. But I needed him. To, it was only five minutes max. I just needed to no. see him sit up because he was out you for asked a second. You, you Did asked you see how much. quickly the doctors ran in? I've never seen the medical staff run in so quickly. That got to be fast. You, you, you're <laughs> dealing. I'm serious. Seconds turn into hours in that situation. And by the way, it's it's rare in a fight that someone gets slept like that. You see guys knocked out and they're away. That was like a Manny Pacquiao shot. Remember when Juan Manuel Marquez hit Manny and put Manny yes, and, Mitch, and Mitch, Mitch, Mitt Romney was like, oh, shit. <laughs> so, um, how much, since you do, you know, you have experience boxing, how much money would it take for you to get in the ring? Like, would you have done it for a million on national be, TV? Or pay per view? Okay. I fight Jake Paul for a million dollars. Okay. Yeah. I fight his brother for a million dollars. Yeah, I fight him. If it, yeah, no problem. I'm not fighting Mike Tyson. And I'm not fucking fighting Roy Jones Jr. Because they just, they, it's, it's a little bit too wild. It's a little bit too much mis- muscle memory. But for a million dollars, I fight somebody on my same level. Those guys are better boxers than me, no doubt about it. But like, because they, they just box way more than I do. They mm-hmm. box every day. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I fight somebody on my level for a million dollars if that was the thing. I'm not fighting one of those. I'm not fighting Mike or Roy. I don't think I would fight for a million. You wouldn't. I've Not never, even. I've never put gloves on. I've never been in like, like I need to eat, at least see what I even feel like. So for one million moment. dollars, you wouldn't fight Hannah B. That's different. She'll know how to box either. Well, so you'll fight her for a million. That's huh? just a fight. So you asking fight? me to fight? You heard what my dad said. It started yeah. young. Right. <laughs> you asking me to fight? Sure. So for a million dollars, you would fight Hannah B. There you trying go. to go viral? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to go viral. I'm just asking. She I'm gets saying. a million. I get a million. You get a Why million. Not? You get a million. This is actually a good idea. A million for charity? No, you haven't no, seen them no do mil- that. Ain't no million You haven't for seen people do that. They do these matches with like some reality TV stars where they have 
they they uh, match them up. And you would buy her for a million bucks. I, that's probably, that makes sense. A million would be good. Now, here's the thing, though. What if you fight her and she walk your Woo! ass? <laughs> How you gonna that's, come back, man? That's that's tough. Mm, a yeah. rematch. There, you have you have no choice but to get back in the ring. I guess you do. If buy- she if she beat me twice, you'll never see me again. Yeah, you're out. It's over. You're out. I take I'm, I'll take my second meal and I'll be out. See, and that, and here's the thing, and that's the situation with Nate. This is why all of these fights have to be interracial, because. It, when you put, there's nothing there's nothing better that's the thing about boxing there's nothing better than a good old interracial slugfest you know yeah. put them in there with somebody and put someone on the line put some cultural points on the line but I will say this I'm not gonna stop well I'm it's over now but I'm not I wasn't I was never not gonna get those jokes to Nate Robinson but I have all the respect in the world for Nate Robinson because there's one thing to get in there uh in some sweaty gym in hmm. Woodland Hills somewhere and fight. But to get in there with them fucking lights on you, with everybody watching you when the, with, under them lights, ugh, that's different, man. I don't know if respect is the word that I would say. I have a lot of respect for him. A lot of respect for him. It took, it took a lot of balls to go and do that. A lot of balls. Sure. Now, it, it, it did. Now, what did you think of the main event? I mean, coming off the hills of that, it's like we could, I, I'm immediately on Twitter. And you know I'm not a big person on Twitter. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I got to hear what people are saying about Snoop. <laughs> I got to see all the memes for Nate. You know, nobody mm-hmm. really, I didn't really care about Jake Paul. I just wanted to see that. So now I'm trying to get my mind ready for Roy, Mike Tyson. Um, I thought Roy came out limping. Did you catch that? To me, he didn't look like he was into the fight from the moment he stepped out. One, he didn't even come out to his own song, which I was extremely disappointed by. Mm-hmm. Two, he had a limp. Mm-hmm. Three, he looked tired by the time he walked from the, from the walkway all the way up into the ring. That's not how Tyson looked. Looks Tyson concerned. looked ready. Mm-hmm. Tyson had shorts on. He was ready to go. He looked good. Best shape you've seen him in a long time. I personally thought he held back in the fight. Oh, of course he did. They, they looked like they had talked it out before. They knew what they were going to do. And, you know, they did it. They made money. They, they created what may be the first of many legends. Mm-hmm. What is it? Legends only league? League, league of legends only? Something like that. Right. Um, and it was it was good. It was great to watch it. It was great. Mm-hmm. And for Roy Jones Jr., it was a bucket list thing to say he fought Tyson. But and I, I wanted, wanted to more. get the fight going for a long time. I, I wanted more from Mike. You wanted more from Mike. You wanted more. I don't but know if a, I wanted a knockout, but I definitely didn't want to see a draw, which it wasn't. He was only throwing his power shots to the body. I like, know. It was, yeah. it was like they planned it. It was very, it was very staged. Right. He was only throwing power shots to the body. Uh, but I still feel that like I respect. I, I feel they, there was like a no knockout thing. There was a no knockout. I, I, thing. Yeah, I respect it because he didn't want to embarrass Roy Jones Jr. That's how I felt. Yeah. Well, or, you know, it, they it, look, there's a different situation now. There, there's some talk about Evander Holyfield jumping in and now. And let Mike and Evander go again. I, I pay to watch that. I think Mike's got his hands full with Evander Holyfield. Who wouldn't pay to watch that? Yeah. By the way, this is this is something that we can do. Oscar De La Hoya is talking about getting back into it, man. Let's let's let the legends they're have legends a fun. only league. That's what they're yeah, legends only they're league. They're starting, legends only. Yeah, legends only. Let's let the legends have a little fun. All right, I'm glad Nate's feeling okay. Uh, <laughs> but these jokes gotta fly, Glenn. I love you, <laughs> Glenn. I love you. What Glenn said was a little different. We should talk about that real quick. What okay. Glenn said was that he felt like Nate Robinson shouldn't have had to do what he had to do. He felt like it was a money grab for Nate Robinson. He called out a couple of people, LeBron James, and says, give, give Nate a job. Why should Nate have to do this after playing all of those years in the NBA? Why aren't there any opportunities? It's just not going to fall on very many favorable ears. And I see what my cousin is talking about and it's making sense. That's his man. And also, I think we think that these athletes plan to leave for a little while and they're set for life, don't have to worry about nothing else. But it's just right. crazy to kind of be in that situation. I think Nate made $24 or $25 million in the, in, in the NBA, especially at a, and, and, you know, that doesn't mean he has $25 million. He obviously doesn't. Sure. But to, to, to make that argument now of what people are going through, that, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? I mean, 
most of this country is out of work. They go in there and get their head beat in for for a million dollars. <laughs> right. I mean, here's the thing. Somebody had to say it. Right. right. So I, I respect Glenn for coming out and saying it. Everything he said was true. Now, he didn't have to be like, I better not catch any of y'all. It's like, OK, it's a little too far. But your point, I, I heard it and you were right. But when I'm looking at Simba push Nate Robinson it's funny. in the back, wake up like he's Mufasa. I'm laughing. It's funny. It's, it's, funny. Funny. it's funny. I don't know what to tell you. It's funny. It's, <laughs> it's funny. fucking funny. <laughs> Um, and to be expected. Come on now. If the worst case, the Nate jokes, knew he was going to get the these jokes. The jokes are going to fly. Nate Robinson is okay. Nate Robinson will be back. Nate Robinson will do, he made a million bucks. The joke, you're not going to get away from these jokes. The jokes is part of the love. He should redo the picture of him on the ground, but lying in a million dollars. And that should be it. And that should be it. No, no caption is necessary. Right. All right. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. Okay, Rage, Dallas is on fire. <laughs> my, I miss my city. Dallas is on fire. I miss it. Got the whole internet in a complete fucking civil war. You guys did not hear. A guy named Kevin Kinney, who is the uh, owner of True Food Kitchen, or True Kitchen, shall I say, True Kitchen and Cocktails down there in Dallas went viral today after a video of him storming out on the floor of True, True, True Kitchen and telling women to have more respect for themselves and be twerking in this restaurant. Apparently, the DJ, for some reason, played Throw That Ass in a Circle, which is a rallying cry for, to throw that ass in the circle. Rachel loves it. And, um, Ooh, it's because it's from, the, it's from our, our area. It's either Arkansas or Texas. Right. As soon as so the beat drops. They, they dun, throw that dun, ass in a circle. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, see, look at Rachel <laughs> going for it. And, and so, and so <laughs> they, uh, they um, apparently, women were twerking. He's, he was upset about I, it. There's I video didn't know of that him. was the song. I'm that sorry. was the song. It was playing Throw That Ass in a Circle. <laughs> So a I video. changed my whole stance. You changed your stance? <laughs> there's a video of him. Initially, the video of him chastising women came out where she told them that he made True Food Kitchen for black people to have a classy place to come and not for you to twerk. Get the fuck out of his restaurant if you want to twerk. Take that shit to other places. So, <laughs> so uh, he said that. But then the story got thicker and thicker over the day. There's... Because lo it looked like to me... He just went too hard on them. But then right. there was video that came out later on. I, there's no sound to the video. Allegedly right. of him walking over to them and asking them before mm -hmm. to stop twerking. He also claims, or you can see it in another video, that these women were standing on his furniture and twerking. And this caused a big rift out there because there are some people out there that are like, he's preaching respectability politics and shaming black women and cursing at black women. And there's another group that says they have no goddamn reason shaking that ass up in a restaurant like that on his furniture. He's right. Rachel, which group do you fall in with? I got to fall in the middle. Now, oh. this is before I knew what song was playing. Which, exactly. if you from the area, there is something, it's like a uh, back that ass up, right? right? As soon as you hear the first five seconds, something happens, you black out, you see red, mm -hmm. and you just start shaking. And if you aren't familiar with the song, it's by Ronnie Lil Mother F. <laughs> it's so good. It's a good song. <laughs> I missed a mm. wedding because of this song. Okay. Like, oh, it's, what happened? I was in Cabo. We were day drinking. The song started playing. It's the last thing I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I missed the wedding. I made it to the reception. It was no. a good time. Mm. Anyways, you feel me if you know that song. Do yourself a favor and download it. Okay, so here's the, here's, here's the problem. Mm. <laughs> His, the underlying message is true. What Kevin was trying to say is right. The problem is, is how he said it. It mm -hmm. is your place of establishment. How can you not? I get it. You told them once. You told them twice. They didn't listen. At this point, just kick them out of the restaurant. 
Why did you, it was almost like a male pride thing, right? You felt, you felt personally disrespected. Mm -hmm. It had nothing to do with your establishment. It had nothing to do with the music or even them. Mm. You personally felt disrespected as a male. So you felt the need and you, and and people saw you being disrespectful, right? Or disrespected. You're going over here telling these women to stop and they continue to twerk. And it seems like it escalated. They were either twerking harder, you know, like they, they, (laughs) they went from the floor, from the chair, to the, you know, to the couch. So he had to let everybody know he was beating his chest and let everyone know this is my restaurant and just took it too far. I, and I mean, could have pretty much ended his entire rest, like uh, establishment. So fans are too divided. Like it looked like that at first, but now it's going to be a lot of people out there because there were so many people on there that agree with what he was saying. They're going to make a point to go to True Food Kitchen or True Kitchen and Cocktails. Man, um, this was Mel Pride at his finest. It, it truly was. He so had which parts no, of it do you agree with then? Well, I agree with the fact that he's like, listen, this is not this type of establishment. It's not the, It's not a club, right? Yeah. It's not day partying. It's not for you to stand up on my furniture and twerk. I get that. If that's yeah. the type of... Like, you should be able to play ratchet music and people can eat. And, and you understand it's not a club. Like, like I, I understand that. Mm-hmm. There's no dance floor. Um... But I don't agree with the fact that he then started cursing, then started basically did what a lot like you see black people do uh, in our own culture. It's us versus them. You put yourself above them and you look down on them. These are people who pay to come into your restaurant to eat your food, listen to your music, and they're supporting your business. There was no need for him to talk like that in front of all those customers. It just, because because he he generalized it, right? He didn't just put it on them. He started talking about everybody in the restaurant. He started generalizing Black people. It became, it, he took it too far. But mm-hmm. the original message, I didn't have a problem with. This isn't this type of place. He says, you can go to Prime, you can go to Pink, and those are two, and those are totally different places. Mm-hmm. Totally different places. Hmm. Okay. He's right. Okay, so here's the thing. There's also a video of him. It's funny. Somebody just sent me a video of him dancing on the tables at True Kitchen and Cocktails. Put it, let me see. <laughs> Is it after hours? <laughs> okay, what okay. did I tell okay. you? Somebody Mel just sent me a video. Of him dancing on tables. Look, you see him right there? He's dancing on tables at True Kitchen and Cocktails. Somebody handed him some Don Julio, and now he's going to drink it. He's dancing on tables at True Kitchen and Cocktails. Mel Pride at his finest. But you know what the reality was? (laughs) The reality was this. It was never about how he wants things conducted in his establishment. Not to Mm -mm. me. I I don't know the guy. He seems to be a guy who's an entrepreneur. He came out later and said he there's a way he wants things to go in his restaurant, blah, 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 blah. And then there are also other rules in the restaurant. Uh, there's a no flip-flops rule, especially no fuzzy flip-flops. There's no athletics. No, 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 no. It has in parentheses no fuzzy flip-flops. It has no fuzzy ones, especially fuzzy ones. No fuzzy ones. Okay. So he's <laughs> not playing with y'all. So, uh, <laughs> so look, I get that. Like if you try to go Mastro's here in Beverly Hills, um, it was a TMZ video we had one time of Juju Smith Schuster, who's a wide receiver for the uh, for the Pittsburgh Steelers, trying to go in Mastros, um, and he has sweatpants on. Mm-hmm. Um, and they just won't let you in. Now we're shooting this right, and Juju Smith Schuster actually takes pants from our camera guy. They switch pants, which is disgusting. But they, our camera guy gives Juju Smith-Schuster his pants and he goes into Mastro's and our camera guy is wearing Juju Smith-Schuster's uh, warm-ups. So mm-hmm. restaurants have the right sure. to dictate the decorum inside of their establishments, okay? They definitely do. Okay. Here's the thing. Number one, twerking doesn't make your establishment any less classy. That's the first thing. The war on twerking has to stop. All right. It, it's a it's a day party. It's a DJ. It's not a day party. It's a restaurant. It's 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 a brunch. They're having brunch. It's a That's brunch. not a day party. That's totally different from a day party. That's cool. This is my thing. There's something about the way that that came off and the way that he chastised black women. Right. Specifically, the the language that he uses that he used to me that speaks to something dip, deeper within him, right. especially after we have video of him dancing on the tables at his own place, right? Right. So there's something about that that's like, 
if you want to do low caste ghetto shit, go do low caste ghetto shit somewhere somewhere else. Right. I just want black people to understand, and the 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 the, the more interesting part of this is what happened on the internet. Because what happened on the internet was we should be able to have fun and be like this or whatever. And the other side of it was actually there's a way to conduct yourself and it's embarrassing and it's ghetto and all of that stuff like yeah, that. I don't like Another, that. So it, I just wonder what point in time are black people going to realize that decency is not going to save them? Okay? So, is, it, so trying to stand up straight, right? And because I've been in restaurants out here in LA where some young pop stars have gone out there and gotten wild, mm -hmm. going crazy. And you know what the people in those restaurants do? They let them do their thing. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? I've been in places where I've seen, I've seen whole tables of white. They, if, the, if the guy comes over and says, chill out, then chill out or don't chill out and leave. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't become a cultural thing. I made this for black people so we can have some place nice to come. So mm -hmm. a place can't be nice if ass is moving in there. Like mm -hmm. it always gets to me when we when we when we say or we think, oh, you wouldn't go and shake your ass in Ruth's Chris. Ruth's Chris ain't family. That's crazy that of all the, the steakhouses they was bringing up in Dallas. They was acting like Ruth's Chris is some six star dining. Yeah, I like Ruth's Chris, which is crazy. There's a bunch of there's a bunch. Right. But Ru Ruth's Chris, they, they probably don't. They're not going to play throw that ass in the circle in Ruth's Chris. Ruth's Chris ain't family. They don't have a DJ. Right. They don't have a DJ. These they steakhouses don't. don't have DJs. So any so so what I'm saying is is that there's something deeper there that we need to kind of talk about. There's, there's, no, no, no. Mastro's has a DJ on the second floor here in Beverly Nick and Sam's does in Dallas too. Yeah, Mastro's has, by the, the way, Staples Steakhouse. by the way, in Mastro's, at Mastro's, inside of there, on the second floor where they have the DJ, I've seen women in there dancing. Normally prostitutes. Did you say dance floor? Sam and Nick and Sam's. Did you say, did you say dance floor? No, there's no dance floor, but I've seen women in there dancing. Is it a bar area where the there's DJ There's a bar is? area right there. Okay, so I've so seen that's women how, at, the, yeah. at the bar area dancing. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, yeah. they're, you know they're, they're working. I mean... But but I've seen them in there dancing. So like what I'm, what I'm saying is like the, the reality of it is even in the tone, when you're coming out and you're speaking to those women like that, yeah. And you're admonishing them and making it out to seem as if they are low class for wanting to celebrate, for wanting to do like that. There's something there. And that there is two things. Number one, that's a very easy uh, male patriarchy bullshit thing, number one. And number yeah. two, there's some respectability in there, some you niggas need to act better. And I think that it's high time we realize that no matter how well we act, the opinions upon about us and about our culture are not going to change from the outside looking in. Right. So we, we can talk about go someplace and act like this. Nah, that's not the way that it works. Yeah. Like, and so for me, it's for me looking at the video, and by the way, context does matter. He did walk over there before and try to talk to them. But then if they don't do it, Kick them out. Don't That's come back what over I'm, here. It, it was a pride thing. It was clearly a pride thing. He felt disrespected. That's why I say, listen, if he doesn't want twerking in his restaurant, there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. And if they continue to do it, just move them out the same way you would if someone had on fuzzy flip-flops, right? You right. would escort them out. If they took off their heels and pulled out their flip-flops out their purse, you would tell them to leave. It violates dress code. Okay, well, this violates the behavior in the restaurant. It's not a club. Or maybe it's not a club until a certain an hour. That's how it all should have been handled. Right. Kicking them out would have been the same effect that he had rather than sitting there and cursing them out. Like, you're the one who came down to a level. You're over here talking about these women. You actually took it there. You became the classless one when you decided to curse people out in the middle of your restaurant and you're yeah. calling yourself an entrepreneur, and which you are, and the owner of the restaurant, but instead, you took it down a level. For the first rule of all of that is always treat black women with respect. If that would have been twerking and no twerking, if uh, it doesn't have to be you or my sister. And I, was, I was mad that he spoke to those ladies like that. Absolutely. I was that he was, you don't speak to black ladies like that. Like, I don't, I was mad that he spoke to those ladies like that. You don't, you cursing them and telling them to get the fuck out and go there. You don't speak to black ladies like that. And if you, and if you value black ladies, 
it wouldn't be in your character to speak to them like that. Like, and if you want to come over there, if you want to make them leave, make them leave. Circa 1998, me, Ryan Davenport, and Jabril Jackson went to Club Upscale on Nicholson Drive in Baton Rouge. Club Upscale was called Club Upscale simply because of the fact that to get inside of Club Upscale, you had to have you had to have your shirt tucked in to your jeans. That's what made it up. That was it. <laughs> That's it. You had to have your shirt tucked in. You know, there was a dress code there. The dress code, you know, keeps things a little bit more kosher so we don't get too wild. My boy Jabril kind of swole. All right? So mm-hmm. he didn't want it. Like, he, Jabril always liked to have it out. He wants you to see the meat. All right? He wants you to see the guns. We go on the club upscale. Jabril takes his shirt off. Manager comes over, says, hey, bro, you got to put your shirt back on. And Jabril puts the shirt back on momentarily. Manager comes over, says one more time, hey, bro, seriously, I don't own the place. I manage it. Either you got to put your shirt on, man, or you got to leave the restaurant. Or you got to leave upscale. And Jabril got, no problem, bro. No problem. You won't see me with it off again. Puts the shirt on, keeps the shirt on the whole time, right? We laughed. Now, if that guy comes over the second time and says, you know what? I'm sick of you niggas coming in here with your shirt off like a bunch of thugs. This ain't that type of place. This ain't the type of place. If you want that, go to Dreams. If you want that, uh, go cross the river. Go to Rags if you want that. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about, I'm not like, I'm I'm sick of y'all. Y'all come in here, y'all need to act better. Y'all need to do this. This ain't that type of place. I I, would have felt played. At that point, I would have felt played to like, nigga, who the fuck you think you talking to? Sure. Like, uh, I, I, even though he had to tell him one time, I would have felt played. Yeah. And so, if you can't play me, you can't play my sisters. So just don't speak to them that way. Yeah. If, if you, if, even if you want to be a jerk about it and kick them out, kick them out. He was fully within his right to do that. Yeah. Look. Yeah. The man played himself. He could handle it. Oh, this this wouldn't even be a topic. But oh, he somebody, handled it wrong. Yeah, we have a very special guest from a very special show. And I say this in a completely serious way. I remember, like, I've almost grown up with Grey's Anatomy. I remember the show when it the first episode was coming on and my homeboy, Ian, his then-girlfriend was like, we got to watch this show. So we watched the show. Let me tell you guys how long Grey's Anatomy has been on. They were girlfriend and boyfriend then. They have since gotten married and been divorced <laughs> Grey's Not Anatomy. Funny. Not funny. <laughs> outlasted their relationship. That's a true story. I'm, I'm not even joking about that. That's a true story. Grey's Anatomy outlasted their relationship. From Grey's Anatomy, we have, I always want to call people by their character names. Kelly McCreary on How <laughs> Learning Today. <laughs> now, when I say that about Grey's Anatomy and that the show's been on for 750 years, like, what does that make you feel? Do you feel like I have the ultimate job security because the show has been on for so long? It's going to go for so long? Or do you feel like, damn, it's coming to an end soon? Like, how do you feel when you hear that? Job security? Where? You know we be killing people all the time. <laughs> 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 no, no. Um, you know, it's funny. Look, I joined the show in... I did a couple of episodes at the e- at the end of season 10, but I, I became a series regular in season 11. And I, myself, everybody on my team was like, it'll probably be a couple of years, you know, mm. this show will be done by then. I mean, what show? No one expected it to go this long. Sure. So I don't know. It's, it's definitely not a sense of job security, but it's definitely like, just because you never know in this business, mm. that you, as you know, I'm sure mm. we're all just freelancers out here, but um, it's, it's wild. Like to, it, it is wild that has gone on so long. I, I, I certainly never expected that. Yeah. yeah. I have started binging Grey's Anatomy during quarantine. Like, hmm. like most people do, you know, you find your show and you get hooked. And when I tell you I'm hooked, is there a name for people like in Bachelor Na- Nation, they're called or it's called Bachelor Nation. If you watch The Bachelorette or your Batchies, is there a Grey's Anatomy name? Is there an army name or is it Grey's Army? I'm not I'm not quite sure what we call us. But you know, I don't know if there is, you know, they give us what they call ship names. 
you know, yeah. when they, when they ship your, right. you and your um, mm-hmm. love interest mm-hmm. character on the show, but I don't know if we have a name for that. Let's call them gravies. Okay. Rabies. Rabies. Great. Rabies. I'm a gravy. Van's a gravy. <laughs> yeah. So for us, gravies, I, I'm curious with you, for you, what has it been like working with Shonda Rhimes? And then also because I'm, I'm new and I've been binging it. The fact that you've been working on a show that shows so much diversity and in a successful way. Yeah. Well, okay. So I'll answer the first question first about working with Shonda. The thing about working with Shonda is that it's like, so I think it was my first or maybe my second year on the show. She published um, her kind of a memoir called The Year of Yes. Mm. And she describes in that book how saying yes to everything, but, you know, to like almost every offer that came her way, every invitation um, expanded her life. And when you think about what she did before she started saying yes, like mm. you know, the, the, the potential for growth and expansion and and, you know, clarifying your idea of yourself, growing more and more confident in your capability and your ability to take over the world. You know, I, I, that has been something to behold. And I have really, um, tried in my small way to, to be influenced by, by her in that way. Um, and then to your other question, hold on, what was it? Oh yeah. (laughs) Diversity. Um, Yeah, I mean, look, Van, I similarly watched the show when it first aired. Uh, I think I was like, that was like my first or second year out of college. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we'd gather around the TV because that's what you did back then. Because we didn't have the, um, we did have, what what was the, um, TiVo. TiVo. Oh, yeah. yeah. TiVo. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But, you know, and I remember sort of being floored by the sort of nonchalance Mm -hmm. with which folks were mingling. You know, it wasn't a black show. It wasn't, you know, a mainstream gay white show. Um, And and, and there was this badass Asian woman character. And then, Mm -hmm. you know, season three, you get the bisexual. Season four, you get the... And it's just like... So talk about normalizing things. It was, it's a space where everything just came in normal. Every yeah. identity um, was able to exist as completely normal in this world. And the, it was mind blowing. I mean, I guess it's kind of sad that it was mind blowing, but it was like, it was mm-hmm. mind blowing. It was revolutionary. It has changed TV. And so, you know, that, that we've been able to keep creating space ongoingly 17 years in you know it feels in a lot of ways like we're doing a service honestly yeah. because mm-hmm. the fact is that these spaces were limited to so many for so long and there are all kinds of people who need and deserve to have their stories put on so mm-hmm. that's there what we're here to do you know i have a name for the Grey's anatomy fans oh. sickos okay uh, i'll tell you Van. why i'll tell you why they're sickos <laughs> all right number one is because, you know, this, this is in a hospital and there's people are sick and stuff like that. And number two is because whenever I walk in on Kalika and she's watching this show, something terrible is happening. Oh, yeah. It, it, when I say something terrible, I mean, it's like the doctors are standing around and it's like, listen, I don't know if you've ever heard this is a rare occurrence. This kid has an ear growing in the middle of their heart. The only person <laughs> that can save them is Derek Shepard. But of course he's dead. <laughs> So what? I need you to go in this I'm room. I'm not there oh. yet. Could you please stop oh. with the spoilers? Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. News flash. <laughs> news flash. Oh, you're kind of late with that one. Yeah, I news flash. Yeah. <laughs> like, news flash. Yeah, he's dead. Like, he died sometime. By the way, it was a big deal, not just okay, on the get show, out. No, I don't want to hear but in more pop culture, sicko. period. All right? He's, he, he, he killed him. <laughs> it was a whole back and forth. He wanted to race. With his family, his wife could didn't want the race. Okay, could anyway. You, uh, no, that was in stop? real life. Anyway, <laughs> so my, my question is, does it get, does it get, because I would wonder, does it get like, um, is it weighty for you guys to have to deal with like, I don't know, sick kids and all of these different things? And they're coming up with new and different like sort of uh, like phenomena, medical phenomena on the show all the time. I'm like, is that a, ever a drag? Is the subject matter of the show being so weighty? Does it ever pull you down? Maybe you didn't want to learn about 
multicellular myelomas or something like that. Like it's, it's, it's sometimes a little depressing. Yeah. I mean, does it get me down? You know, I'll say this at the end of every season, I do feel like I'm, I'm like coming out of deep water for air. I'm like, mm-hmm. that was a lot. Um, and, but at the same time, while we're shooting it, you know, every table read, let me put it this way. Every table read ends in tears. Okay. <laughs> I mean, Aww. we're all sort of like, oh my God, this is so sad. This is so moving. But I also think that something about the way that the show is written being kind of like, you know, there are lessons to be learned from these terrible situations. These, these situations cause people to uh, have to grow. And then more than that, and not just because we don't want to just use these like sick characters and, and tragic stories just for like as vehicles for our characters, even though sometimes they are knowing that our depiction of these real life circumstances that do cause pain and suffering for people actually enables the people for whom the the pain and suffering has been caused to feel seen, Mm. feel like they're not alone, feel like somebody knows what they're going through, feel like, you know, and now more people understand if they've got mental illness, you know, what it is that, you know, how they experience the world, you know, knowing that we're doing that kind of thing, kind of, that takes the weight off, certainly, Mm. you know, Um, and and, you know, look, the good drama is high stakes life or death drama. I'm yeah. sorry. So, you know, I'm an actor. I like to I like to play in that world. Um, you know, it, it is that's where the good stories are. That's where the good humanity is. So mm-hmm. that and naked and afraid. So that's where the really good. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. So into that. Um, oh, God, I was going to ask you a question about that, but I, I'm trying to stay on. I'm, I'm trying to stay on. <laughs> On track, because I, I I do want to talk about things that you're doing outside of Grey's Anatomy, because it's really, really impressive. Um, you're from Milwaukee. I used yeah. to live in Milwaukee for three years. What? Yeah, girl. I went to Marquette. I went to Marquette Law School. You. All right. Yeah. Three years. I am a Milwaukeean. I, they adopted me in. I was in I was in the Milwaukee streets. That's oh, another yes. that's another podcast. <laughs> yes. Hey, about the Milwaukee streets. I know very little about them because I left when I was 17. Mm. I was never like an adult in Milwaukee. Mm. So, mm. Mm. so you didn't know. spend time on Water Street. No. You know what? No, What's but I think here? that's where all the good that's where all the good like pubs and stuff are. We don't call them pubs, breweries. Breweries in Milwaukee are, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It goes up. There's like uh, between Water Street and I can't, maybe Jefferson, between all of that is where it's it, it goes down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, again, Dude, you keep talking. Are you trying to join I'm her sorry. sorority? Like you guys are like, as you guys are becoming best friends here, I ain't never been to Milwaukee. I know that's Giannis, why I wanted to Giannis bring it out up. In the Kupo. That's it. That's all I know about Milwaukee. Shout out to Milwaukee. But <laughs> not even but, from he's not even from there. I know, I, but, I, but that but there's very few, not a very few, but you know, it's it's rare that you get to talk with someone who understands Milwaukee. That's why mm-hmm. I wanted to point that out. Anyways, back to <laughs> back to the topic. <laughs> what, how you're using your platform and the things that you're doing are so inspirational. And I specifically want to talk about the Wednesday morning podcast. It was a scripted podcast that you did. And I know that it was centered around voting, but I just want to know what was the inspiration behind doing that? I know you worked on that with your husband. And then will we see more things like that from you guys? Yeah. Um, so Wednesday morning was conceived by my husband and his writing partner, my husband, Pete Chapman, his writing partner, Candace Sanchez McFarland. It was conceived in the beginning of quarantine. It was actually now I, I wish he was here to, to get this right, but, um, basically right before production shut down, he's a director, a TV director. Um, and right before production shut down, he was in a meeting where everybody's phones were going off alerts, 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 like, you know, and everything was catastrophic. It was like Trump, this COVID that, you know, this everything. And, um, and we had been, he and I together had been trying to cook up an idea for some way to tell the stories of these varying perspectives that are all coming to a head right now. 
Hmm. Little did we know there would be a pandemic and a racial reckoning and shit would really, really hit the fan. But like, um, before all of that, um, we, we wanted, because we're both politically minded, politically involved, we try to stay engaged, we try to create art, um, that helps people understand one another a little bit better. And, um, and so that was sort of where it was born. And it was born from this, like this sort of panic mode of receiving information and sending out information and what would that be like on the day after the election in this country should an autocratic authoritarian style leader be reelected? Um, so that was the, that's kind of a long winded version of it. We have stories to tell. Yes. So we'll be doing more. It, it, it was meant to be a, a short film, but because of COVID, you know, we just weren't sure how we would be able to, there were, you can scrap a, a short film together pretty, not easily, but like you can we get on a weekend with your friends, you know, mm-hmm. um, and uh, but with COVID, the, the the shooting protocols were going to make things challenging. So we adapted it into a narrative mm. podcast. And that was really, really fun. And it also changed the way we told the story. You know, it's not mm-hmm. visual. You have right. to, like, describe things differently. You have to illustrate these characters and these experiences in a different way. So, so yeah. So we had a great time doing that. So we'll do more. Hmm. Great. Now, you've been very, very outspoken with your support of President Trump. And I just wanted to... Um, what? Nah, I have it right here. <laughs> it's, it's right here on my sheet. It's right here on my sheet. <laughs> no, it's right here. I got it right here. It's right here on my fact sheet. See, right. uh, no. Uh, no, seriously. So, <laughs> um, uh, no. It, it, uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin ended up becoming uh, a very, very pivotal place in the election. Okay, now you being from there, yeah. uh, do you ever take it personally when the president insinuates that all these illegal, illegal votes are coming out of cities like Milwaukee that, you know, where people got out heavily black counties and voted for Joe Biden, that in some way he thinks that all the election corruption in America exists in uh, Milwaukee, Atlanta, Detroit, and <laughs> Philly. Like all of those people. Um, being that you're politically minded, like being from an area where people really turned out to vote, uh, thanks to people like Stacey Abrams, what do you make of all of that part of it? Not to get too political, but just to ask you because it's your it's your backyard. Oh, man. The answer to this question, like most questions these days, is white supremacy and systemic racism. So mm. <laughs> I feel like... You know, and what I mean by that is I'm no more offended by it because I'm from Milwaukee Mm -hmm. than I think any Black person in this country should be offended by it being from anywhere. Um, There is a long history um, of disenfranchising us from the vote in this country. And it's always taken (laughs) forms that are, you know, creative, uh, you know, from like these literacy tests at the polls and poll taxes, all kinds of things from back in the Jim Crow era to, to now they're, they're just finding new ways of delegitimizing Mm. our participation in the electoral process that is woven into the fabric of this country. Like, let's be a hundred about that. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I take it personally. I find it deeply frustrating. And um, sometimes it feels like we're just like running on the same damn hamster wheel, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. solving the same problems over and over and over again. But um, I do feel, look, you mentioned Stacey Abrams. If she can be optimistic, then I certainly can mm-hmm. find some. Yeah. Some for sure. silver lining and some sense of personal and community empowerment to to keep us going because you know we have to. Mm, yeah. yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. yeah. Um, one of the things I want to ask you something else that you've been doing is the table reads. 
And we've seen you do these classic shows like Golden Girls, 227, mm. Different Worlds. So I have classics. to ask you, what's next? And is there like a dream show you're wanting to do a table read of? That's such a great question. You know, those were set up to end before the election. <laughs> right. I don't know if we're going to do anything. Um, it was a it was a really fun and um, I think kind of brilliant strategy for for increasing voter engagement by inviting people in to something that they would find fun and then just checking in to see like, have you registered to vote? Have you done your census? And that kind of strategizing can be done about all kinds of things ongoingly, you know, not just mm-hmm. the national elections and national <clears throat> events like the census. So, so, you know, can it be translated? You know, it really could. What I would love to do, I mean, there are so many shows I would love to do, but I think it would be fun to do Sex in the City. Okay. I think it would be fun. Mm, yeah. Um, you know, I think it would be so fun to do like, oh, I don't, I don't know. I was about to say something that I feel like I should. should the Cosby say. Show. Yeah. You're about to say the Cosby Show. Sister, I know. No, I, sister, listen, we, sister, we grew up on it. Sister, it's okay. Listen, I know. Look, you're, you're amongst friends. Uh, last week on Twitter, somebody asked me, they said, Van, give me your top five sitcoms. I named four shows and then the parentheses I had redacted. And the reason why I redacted it was because I didn't feel like I know, I know it's okay. It's okay. It's it's a weird thing. And now you can't detract from it, but it's the way that it goes. It's tough. It's tough, but no. Well, look, let me be a hundred percent clear here. Like that is, it's, it's, it's a weird thing that happens in the mind, which by the way, I don't have with a lot of other, um, uh, artists who, um, have done horrible things. Yeah, very, sure. mm-hmm. For a lot of other people, it's very easy for me to just be like, okay, I'm done with Woody Allen. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. More. Um, but there is, I do think there is something for me personally, um, different about just the experience of, like you said, um, Rachel having grown up with it and I'm able to do this weird mental fracture between, um, you know, the character and the show and the man. And I, I, I'm not, I don't know if that's right or wrong. I really don't. It's, it's, a, it's, it's very, it's very much a mess. And I, and I, I have weirdly like avoided the show quite a bit, you know, when it comes on and I, yep. I don't like talking about it. It's sad. It's, I know. It's, it's I sad. Know. It's, it's to find out that, you know, that, that person was a monster and um, did so, so much terrible harm. Um, and, and you know what else it is? What else, what else it does to you? It puts you in a weird position because what you're going through by not being able to love your favorite show as a kid doesn't even compare to what those women get, went through, right? right? So exactly. you're sitting, you're sitting here thinking, "Man, it sucks that I can't watch a car. Then, then something snaps and you go, "That you can't watch a fucking show." It's like that is, yeah. <laughs> right. I'm sure I can, man. I'll survive. I'll oh, yeah, survive. I'll right. Be, yeah, we'll be okay without it. But some people yeah. are scarred and forever changed, and they can't get it back. And yeah. it's it's just it's. But you know, this is life. Uh, my mom, my mom was telling me, she's like, you know, but my, my mother said, we had my mother on the podcast, but my mother told me like when that first came out, I was super disappointed. She was like, oh, it's not going to be the last time. She was like, as you continue to <laughs> go for it in life, a lot of these people that you loved, you're going to learn more stuff about them and you're going to have to make some decisions. So shout out to mm-hmm. mom for not trying to give me an easy uh, bed to land in. One last, last question for you. This is the most controversial question I'm going to ask you in this entire <laughs> Situation. This More is than controversy. I just walk myself into. <laughs> no, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. This is, you'll be fine. But this is the controversy. It's very it's controversial. It's a tough question. Who is? Forget about who you know. Forget about who you're friends with. Forget about who's the nicest person or who you've met at a party or something. Who is based on looks alone, the best looking guy in the history of Grey's Anatomy. Looks alone. Oof. Oof. L- looks alone. I'm talking about roll out Jesse, roll out McSteamy, roll out McDreamy, roll out 
the brother that's the chief, because he's got a, a older, sort of smoldering sexuality. Richard. Richard. I don't know his real name. He's got a sexual. <laughs> I saw him in Craig's one time. Shout out. He, he showed love. Like he got a, <laughs> like he, he got like a sort of TV daddy now. Come yeah, on. TV dad. Yeah, yeah. So he got he got a thing to him too. It's oh a lot of guys. Oh my gosh, your TV dad. Now I'm knowing I'm really understanding what's oh. happening here. Yeah, you oh. know, she, she's married to sister. You didn't Stop. know that? <laughs> <laughs> she's married to sister. Because married his mom, <laughs> like a man, little bit please. of El Chocolate. Amanda's oh, mom like the El Chocolate. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's Amanda's sister. You're you know, welcome. Well, you, don't, you don't watch the... the this I'm is, in this, season three. This is basic shit, though. <laughs> I'm in like, season uh, three. Please right. don't do me like this. Okay. <sighs> What's the answer to the question? I hate, I'm done. Mm-hmm. I'm done after this, man. Do the show, the rest of the show yourself. <laughs> Best looking guy, history of Grey's Anatomy. It's time for Kelly McCreary to go viral. God. Um, uh, this is so weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know how you make it, you know how you make it not weird? You just start off by saying, hey, they're all fantastic looking. Right? They're all fantastic looking. You know what? Here's mm-hmm. one. I got one. I got one for you. Mm-hmm. Denzel Washington. He directed what? an episode. Ooh. Ooh. She got you. She got you. Ooh. She got you. That counts. Kelly. That counts. Kelly, <laughs> I'm so glad you're messing around with politics. You got a future in politics, Kelly. <laughs> uh, you, the, you got a future in politics. I'm telling you right there. That, that was that was good. I didn't even see that one coming. I was like, I got her. We got a moment. She's gonna say something, and you know, we're gonna we could get it. Because people you, you can say say Jesse, and then that's oh, whatever. It's born answer. Shout out to Jesse. But like, but you you really took it. I like that. That's Kelly. good, Kelly Marquette, Mil- Milwaukee. <laughs> <He didn't go laughs> uh, uh, all right, we are so thrilled that you took this time with us today. Yes, um, good chatting with you guys. Hey, congratulations on your awesome podcast. At you know, great quarantine project. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we started during quarantine. Thank you so much. Really, mm. it's great. I enjoy it. Thank you for having me. No problem. Thank you for coming out. Or, well, not coming out. You didn't come out. You, you Zoomed from right there. By the way, before we leave, as far as backgrounds go, you're the leader in the clubhouse. Yeah. It's not even close. Yeah. yeah the artwork. For sure. The, the red, popping. the red, yeah. The red. The red mm, you're the leader said red, something red in every room. Yeah. Yeah. <gasps> yeah. No. Well, good. thank you very much. No yeah. problem. All right. Uh, that is enough with Kelly McCreer. You guys watch Grey's Anatomy. It's every Thursday night, right? That's right. It's every Thursday night. And bring your tissues. Bring your tissues. Because last time, I don't know if Rachel on the last time, she was on the beach. And then she had a, she kind of like, she's in between, like in the gloaming. She's in the in-between situation. We don't know if she's okay or whatever. Anyway. All right. Uh, Bye to Kelly McCree. We're going to (laughs) pick right back up. We're going to take a break. Come back. More higher learning. Somebody just hit me up with something. Wow. Um, Yo, Van, I'm a first-time Bachelorette watcher. And I just started watching because of you guys' podcast. Uh, yo, I got to ask. The Tasha joint is doing a lot of kissing with most of the guys. Did anyone ever catch Mono on the show? And I, and also, I never, meet, never met one black person who's ever caught Mono. Have you? This is from, <laughs> this is from Scotty Pimpin, uh, Boss Wilson132 on Twitter. Scotty Pimpin is, is, that's a great name. He asked me. Uh, has has anyone mm-hmm. ever two questions for Rachel? Has anyone ever caught mono on the show? Caught mono on the show? Mm-hmm. And have you ever known a Negro to catch mono? Uh, to my knowledge, no, no one's ever caught it. You get thoroughly tested for these mm-hmm. things prior mm-hmm. to coming on to the show. Right. Um, and I've no, I've never met anybody black that's caught mono. Do they tell you? I've never known anyone black to caught mono too. Do they tell you on the show which? Are, are some STDs on the show acceptable and then some aren't? No, 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 no. So any STD and you're done. Yeah, because there's several people who are, you hear that where you don't know them personally, but it's like, man, we had great candidates, but they didn't pass they got the hit with STD that. test. They yeah. got hit with it the STD test. It happens a test. lot, apparently. A lot. More than getting eliminated for psych, more than a criminal background. The biggest thing is the STD test. And... That makes a lot of sense because, you know, people got STDs. Yeah. I mean, we act like it's some kind of, we act like it's some sort of scarlet letter. 
But people got STDs, man. They got yeah. herp dog. They got gonorrhea. They got sif sif. They got they they have these things, and it's not like it's the dirty people that have it either. People got that hurt. People got that sif hurt. sif. People got gun 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 gun. People got it. People got <laughs> these. They ha- they have these things. You know what I mean? They have uh, hip of. I call yeah. it hip hip of the HPV. Oh. They, 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 you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like they people have they have these things, and we act like it. That's the next thing. We talk about a lot of things, but they shame people a lot for having been in the situation where absolutely where where they where they where they, where they call it a little hip of you know what yeah. I'm saying? When everybody, other people got, probably, everybody, everybody got hip of. What is it like? Eighty percent? It's, it's a high. It's a it's a high number because men usually don't show any symptoms, and so y'all just transmit it, carry it, just infecting people left and right. What should we do about that? Well, there's like, a vaccination for it if you're... For HIPAA? But what should mm-hmm. we do... Like for like, kids, like starting young. But if we know that somebody doesn't have HIPAA, shouldn't we elevate them to the top of society if 80% people got it? We can. We can. You want to like, start... Well, not, what? Not, I mean, not, not Are like, you going to be okay if you fall in the 80%? No, nah, it's cool. It's not bothering me now. So, I mean, you know, it's like if I have... If somebody came and told me I had it now, I'd be like, it's not big a deal. But it would be a problem with whoever you're intimate with. But... It, it, no, because if, yes. if they got it too, right? But that's a problem. Like in women, it can cause cancer. In women, it can have long-term effects. It can be dormant for so long. So then why doesn't everybody take the HIPAA vaccine then? Well, it's, it, it's kind of new. Oh, it just came out? Not just like dropped? new, but like I, like in the last 10 years or so. Maybe I even less than that. Okay, thank oh, you, Jackson. Jackson. You got the HIPAA thank vaccine? Thank you, Jackson. I got the vaccine. I'm just saying I'm young enough where I, oh. I got the vaccine. Oh, oh wow! You, I, oh, thought, I, I, thought the, he meant, I don't have the disease. I have the vaccine. Okay, you oh. gotta be. You gotta clarify oh, on this. Wait, you, wait you, you, just, you just rolled it and said, "I got it." I got it. I got, Jackson, I got, got, the, I got the, the vaccine. Y'all talking about the vaccine? I got the vaccine. Jackson, first of all, it's a safe space. We don't shame anybody based upon shaming. diagnosis I'm just here. And and the reality is, it, I think that's very brave of you to come out <laughs> in the situation where we're talking about how people def, def, definitely need to be more open with people who have STIs, STDs, definitely be, it's not a scarlet letter. You shouldn't shame them. You should make fun of them. It's I something that happens. And so for you to come out, Jackson, and I actually... That I have the vaccine for HPV. We, Jackson, how old, enough, are you? how old are you? I'm 24. So, and you got it at probably what age? I don't know. When I was like a teenager, probably. I don't know. Yeah, remember. yeah. So what, so so what were you doing? So how did you, do you know who you got it from? <laughs> <laughs> I got it. Okay, I'm going against my own shit. Seriously, listen, anybody yeah. out there that has a medical condition or something like that, it's really, really okay. You're a still person. You're not dirty. You're not anything like that. It's cool. Uh, seriously. Now, um, very important to say. Okay, so uh, obviously it's time. We have Parents Day on the podcast. By the way, thank you for introducing Shout me out to, to your our parents. parents. Oh, I know. Our parents I kept listened. it real. Yeah, yeah, they did. They yeah. did. Tell your, like, look. Everybody count the curse words. Somebody count the curse words. Man, in the you've podcast. been good. You know, you've I, been I've good. I've been doing honestly. better. Mr. Lindsay, he got through. Has he been <laughs> in your head? He has. Like, I was watching the Broncos Saints game yesterday, <laughs> and it would be like, Lindsay with the ball. And every time I'd look over and see if your dad. <laughs> that's, uh, you know, that's my that, first cousin. Is that true? You know, Philip was my first cousin. Philip Lindsay's your first cousin? No, nah, I just thought true. I'd throw that on I'm my daddy's the, oh. side. Like, you know, because oh. Big Baby was, you know. Oh, same But it's spelled, it's spelled the same way. It A-Y. is. And I'm like, I looked over every time I was seeing him, I'm Lindsay, I'm like, oh, I'm okay. I'm standing up straight, <laughs> uh, judge. Um, but no, because uh, we did Parents Day on Thursday, we didn't get a chance to do uh, Bash Recap. We did not get a chance to do it. Yes. Uh, and I watched the episode. All right. This was, this was one that uh, has crossover topics with higher learning. It does. Why? Why do you say that? Well, because of the sit down between Ivan and Tasha. Okay. So That's a lot only... of people wanted to know what Van's thoughts were. Okay. A couple of thoughts. Number one, I thought I, it was... I, I warned you that this was happening. Yeah, I said, I I'm it... very interested. I thought it was touching that they bore their feelings like that. I'm glad to see that Ivan became a sactivist. Um, That's what we used to call these guys back in, back in uh, college. Guys that were activists so they could get girls in a sack. Sactivist. I he, fully was aware of what you put together there. Yeah, he's a sactivist. <laughs> he's a 
Some <laughs> activists is out there like, girl, we got to say the whales. The meeting is in my dorm room. 9.30. <laughs> it's just me and you. We're still trying to build the club. Um, uh, look, here's the thing. If you guys really want to know how I feel, I don't like that type of shit. It, to, to, uh, to me, I, I understood it. I, I, I get it. That was kind of some weak ass shit, though, man. Like I understand. And why? And why, Van? No, 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 no. And why? It was why. Why to me is because it was. It, it, I didn't feel. I couldn't connect to the feelings. It seemed like it was. It seemed foreign. Them together seemed the way white people felt about the whole thing. They said they felt sad and not mad. They. I couldn't relate to it. There was a lot of talk about, uh, you know, where I come from and being mixed, and it, it, there wasn't any, there wasn't any power behind it. I didn't feel like there was anything that was. I didn't feel like either one of them. By the way, this is just me completely. I'm sure that they both feel deeply about the situation. They, they obviously did. They cried and shit, but that situation wasn't. I, it was alien to me. That wasn't the way a lot of my friends and people who were around me felt about that. We were activated. We were ready to go. We were ready to get it. We were ready to, to go out there and do whatever what we, whatever we had to do. And I didn't get that from them. It was kind of like some soft TV bullshit a little bit. But that's just my opinion of it. And it's, uh, it's, we have to be honest on the podcast, but I did not connect with the moment at all. So this is why I was really waiting for you to watch this episode and to hear mm -hmm. your take on it because a lot of times in Bachelor Nation, the fans give contestants a hand clap for mediocrity. Right. Like it's so mind-blowing because they did the basic minimum. It's so mind-blowing that George Floyd's name was mentioned on primetime TV. Mm -hmm. You know, kudos to Bachelor to the franchise for even having a conversation because we know years ago that would never even happen. I personally thought Ivan carried the conversation. He did. And I felt like Ivan was the one who was talking. I appreciated him saying I used to think this way and seeing my brother go through something else. I think of it different. I thought him crying was kind of showing his being upset and frustration. I think I was more, you know, you don't know this from Bachelor Nation, but it's the lead who carries the show, right? right? It's your show. You're in control. And it was a little disappointing to me that as the lead, Taisha wasn't leading that conversation. And even when, ha when she had the opportunity to lead, she didn't. So I think that's why, to me, it was a little disappointing. It was a little watered down. Plus being shocked by the fact that he was called the N-word. Being shocked that, that he was biracial with Filipino and Black. I'm mm -hmm. just like, I wish they would have, I would, honestly wish they would have edited those things out to make her look a little bit better because I thought it didn't do her uh, um, any type of benefit. And it's interesting to hear white people in Bachelor Nation talk about it versus black people talk about it because black people will say that there was no depth to that conversation yeah, and they didn't get anything from it. As were white people were applauding it as if, you know, it was Angela Davis and, you know, Stokely Carmichael having a conversation. Yeah, I mean, look, they don't, they don't even know who those people are. White people, <laughs> but um, but uh, shout out to the white people. Who listen to them. But I hear y'all typing on Wikipedia right now. Um, <laughs> but uh, but no, look, look, it's very difficult to be critical of people when they're in a vulnerable moment. It's something that doesn't sit right with me, and I do, I do get that it was a vulnerable moment. I can imagine what it would be like being in a bubble because remember we were able in that in that in that moment to express ourselves. We went to protests. We went out. We did things. Do you know but when the bubble started? When that did the was a, start? that conversation happened in August. Okay, so we had we had already been through oh, things. What? Yes, that so like don't, I like let me give you some context there. Wait, wait, Met, then, well, well, uh, that conversation happened in August. The switch happened at the end of July. I think Tasha's season started the first week of August. So that conversation happened mid. So, so Ivan had been in the bubble longer. So Ivan had been in that bubble since mid July. That well, still meant you I had got, the I only thing say. he the only thing he probably had not heard about was what happened in Kenosha. That's that might have been the only nah, thing he didn't know. That's a that's kind of like a fuck the whole thing. Man. That's like that. That's a little different. Oh man, you know what? 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move forward in love. I think that even though I personally felt the moment was bullshit, I could see how it probably meant a lot to them. Having their connecting like that, biracial, we're sitting down, you know, you know, Ivan's using it to his advantage, which is grotesque <laughs> in a way. Um, but uh but I actually it, liked Ivan in this, but Ivan Ivan's cool. I Ivan's thought he was a square up until this point. So they, that's why it, he impressed me. It wasn't my favorite moment. By the way, not my favorite episode, I should say real quick. My oh, that seems to keep happening a lot lately. My thoughts on Bennett haven't changed. Not at all. They just won't, they 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 won't change. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody sent me a picture of Bennett standing in front of a fucking outcast mural. They won't change. My thoughts on <laughs> Bennett. I've never been more wrong about anything than I was wrong about Bennett when I looked at the whole cast and stuff like that. My thoughts on Bennett haven't changed. They, they're not going to change. Bennett's fucking man. And you guys got to deal with it. It's Bennett's world and we're living in Bennett's world. Mm-hmm. Okay? Bennett should be the next Bachelor. He should. I couldn't agree with you more. Bennett, Bennett should be the next Bachelor. Bennett, to win it, okay? Uh, other than that, I'm having problems connecting with the show. I'm not going to lie. Why? Why? No, nope, come on, give me more. Why? Did I not just, warn you of this? You did. Your friend tried to tell you this gonna, day was going to come. I'm not going to lie, guys. I kind of miss Chip and Dale. <laughs> Chip and Dale kept it fresh. Chip and Dale were like, you know, Chip and Dale were like, Chip and Dale, now Chip and Dale are corny as hell. And people keep sending me clips of Chippendale doing different corny things, and it's true. I really want to start, I, I really want to start a different, a whole Instagram page called Chippendale and just put their corny moments on there because they're the worst. They're the couple that, you know, you don't invite to the dinner party because it's like, <laughs> we, we can't do them again this week. Um, but no, yeah, it, it is getting to the point. Look, I'm not, I'm not off of the show, but also about that show, that is two hours long. It's, That's a it's lot long. of batch, bro. That's a lot of batch. I don't understand why they don't just make an hour. They can have like twice as long of a season. Like this, this last one was it's two long. hours long. My God. It's a lot. I could go watch Tango and Cash and still have some left <laughs> over. You know what I mean? It's a lot. It's a commitment. It's a commitment. Yeah. All right. Uh, look. You go, you know what, guys? It's been a great episode. Man. Thank you, so many of you people to uh that have reached out, you know, talk to me personally about my mom, about my little health hiccup and all of that stuff like that. Uh but more than anything, shout out to the people who hit me up all the time and tell me how much the podcast helps them during this time. Mm. I am so handcuffed right now to this despair that we're in. This moment is sucks so bad. Like it's just so bad. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not cut out for this. I'm not cut out for all of this at the same time. If I'd have known this would have come, how would your life be different right now? Ooh, if you'd question. have known that this was coming, all of this, what would you have been doing? Honestly, Van, it's better that I didn't know it was coming. Mm. Because I didn't know, I I'm I'm very type A. I'm very, I always say, if I had known that this was coming, I would have told you I won't survive this, nothing. But because it just happened and we had to adjust in the moment, it was almost like a survival thing mm-hmm. as opposed to planning for it coming. I don't know if I ever would have been able to mentally prepare for this. Because here's the thing, I would have planned and then I still wouldn't have been ready for what's to come. Think about where we are right now, okay? We, we were locked down. We're in a place in, in Los Angeles County that we were back in... March and April. Mm -hmm. Everyone around us is moving around, going to gyms, going out, um, can go to restaurants. And we can't. We're on lockdown and on a holiday weekend. I mean, you look around and there's truly nothing that you can do other than go outside for a walk. Mm -hmm. We're back where we were before. If I had planned for this, I would have said, oh, we'll be in this for two months and things will start opening up. People will get better. People will start to, you know, pay attention to what the scientists and the doctors are saying. They will realize that hospitals are overwhelmed, that we're sick, that we're mentally suffering, that like we can't stay in this place forever and everybody will do their part for the sake of humanity. 
That's what I would have thought. Never in my wildest dreams would I think that we're here at the end of the year and we are in a worse position than we were in March when we didn't know anything about this virus. And here we are on the verge of, we're shut down in LA and we're pre- and they're waiting to see what's going to happen with the fallout for Thanksgiving. And I know a club in Dallas that just opened up that was packed. I'm watching people like Regine throw a huge birthday party where all these people are celebrating. Like they just don't care. So I could have never mentally prepared for this. And if I had, and we would still be in this place now, knowing that I prepared for it, I would have lost my shit. Mm. Mm. I, yeah, look, I look well said. Um, I, I, I don't know. I think mentally, for me, I would have rather known. Because if I knew that it was coming, um, I wouldn't have... Oh, I, 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 mentally, I've overreacted. And now I don't know how to do anything but overreact. Mm. And so now every little thing, like, I'm just so turned up with anxiety. Like, like if you jump out at me, I'll, I'll jump. You know what I mean? It's like... Uh, <clears throat> my body's in traction, it feels like almost. It's weird. So uh, mentally, mentally, I would have prepared differently. I'll tell you what, though. I think the lesson that has to come out of it is I have to now prepare myself uh, in the future for instances like this, right? Just have enough coping techniques and self-care that I can go through uh, in order to get through things. Um, mm-hmm. and I think that's a big time lesson, uh, that, that, that I've learned, you know what I mean? But this is whack. Like it's, it's, it's tough. And for everybody out there, man, I feel you stay safe, stay happy and try to, that's why you think I'm not going to joke on Nate Robinson. Think about if Nate Robinson getting knocked the fuck out was the worst problem we had. You can't tell me not to joke about that. Yeah. That's a 2019 issue. Like, that's a that's a 2018 issue. That's a 2016 issue. Oh, how bad are you joking? No. I'm going to take every fucking laugh <laughs> I can get. Every laugh I can get, I'm going to take it. So, Nate... He said he did it for the culture. And, and he, he did. did. <laughs> he did. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> All right, y'all. We will see y'all again Friday. We up out of here taking thing caps off, but do not stop learning. I am Van Lathan. I am Rachel Lindsay. Peace. Peace.